Welcome to the 3 p.m. session of the Lang Dean's Honor Symposium. This is the second annual symposium, um, and hopefully you're in the right place. This is Discover, Create, Inherit, How Cultural Legacy Spans the Globe. And I just want to make a couple of uh, quick introductory uh, statements and some housekeeping. So if, if you're just joining the symposium, this is uh, a panel where the students presenting come from different areas of study and years in their academic careers. And they've been working together with a faculty advisor since January to blend cross-disciplinary projects into a cohesive panel. And so this is the second um, session with concurrent panels. There's also three sessions at 4 p.m. And there are programs and um, an overview of the entire symposium schedule on the table in the back for your reference. And this presentation will end promptly at about 3.50 um, to make room for the next panel, but we invite you to stay and also um, see what other sessions you might like to join. So uh, we'll get started. All right, my name is Mark Laramore. I was uh, the faculty advisor for this thing. It was a great pleasure um, to work with these wonderful people whom I now introduce to you. So, oh, even for that, for the introduction. Yes. My name is Mark. Um, I had the great pleasure of being the uh, facilitator for this really wonderful thing that I'm really glad, glad that you've come for. Um, so let me introduce to you Equa, Myra, and Leigh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Discover, Create, Inherit. I'm Equa. I'm Jamira. And I'm Jale. And so with Discover, Create, Inherit, we brought together very three different very projects. And we wanted to share with you the excitement of our discussions. And we brought them together because we wanted to bring them in conversation. So I'm a graduated senior. I finished my last semester. And I used that opportunity to travel to Kenya, a place where my heritage, my paternal home, and I looked at how youth culture is being transformed by social media. So right now, we have two very vibrant case studies, such as Nest Collective, which is a group of young people from Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, that are utilizing their space to create films, music, artwork, really talking about the issues that affect youth today. And then we have Too Many Siblings, a brother and sister duo that use the thrift culture of Nairobi and kind of transform them so that young people can actually think that thrift, thrifting is a great way to shop and find fashions. And so I used both of those case studies to look at how the creative economy is now thriving and can out compete at a global scale. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamira Sally. I am a second year here at Lang, majoring in urban studies with plans to minor in dance in the fall next semester. So over the summer, I participated in a six-week internship in Brooklyn at a nonprofit organization called Bailey's Cafe. It's not an actual cafe, but it's like a community center. And the woman who created Bailey's Cafe 13 years ago, her name is Stephanie Siegel, she she created it after reading a book called Bailey's Cafe by Gloria Naylor, and she took that idea, brought it to real life, and created her own cafe. And during this time that I was working at Bailey's, interning with Bailey's, I also participated in a 10-day dance-focused internship with Urban Bush Woman Summer Leadership Institute, where I sought out to understand through dance, song, story sharing, um, circles with community members, what does it mean to explore social issues through dance? How do we break down issues like oppression and sexism through dance? And the experiences that I took away from UBW, I brought all that knowledge back to Bailey's Cafe. Thank you, Ajumaira. Hi, everyone. I'm Jale. Um, you can call me Lei. And I'm um, originally from China. So for my um, project, which was actually an independent study that I did last summer um, on urbanism in China, because I'm an architecture and a philosophy major, I'm doing the BAFA program here at the New School. Um, I was actually interested in investigating what makes a city a home. Um, because especially with how fast economic development has accelerated in China, 
I felt that you know each summer or winter break I return home I find a different landscape it's a new skyscraper coming up or a new building and that sense of familiarity um, felt a little lost so I was interested in what are the features of a city of the home that makes it a home and I wanted to see how these sensibilities could be investigated and sort of brought to light three really different projects <laughs> but we decided that we could come together and we even named our presentation Discover and Create Inherit because we each discovered something new, whether it was in our familiar place of Brooklyn or China and in Kenya. And we created our own various projects and we inherited something new. And so within each of these categories, we're going to discuss how oh, all of the... <laughs> Of course, the wonderful globe, but within each of those, we are definitely going to make various connections. And so we invite you all to join us by the form of this globe. So it's not just here, it's stationary. It's not stationary, actually. It's meant to move. And we invite you to put stickers of where you consider your most formal connection. There you go. So pass them along, and we'll continue. Yes, feel free to put more than one. There's more stickers. Let me open this for you. There we go. You guys can open it, but. <laughs> we invite you all to join, join us on this journey. So. With that being said, <laughs> discover. And as we go on, you'll see looping images of what has described our various projects, but also what has inspired us throughout this presentation. So with discover, in its true and most archaic definition, it means to make known, reveal, and disclose. But I know that once on the ground within our various projects, that definition completely changed. And so I ask, from that framework and understanding, what drew you to discover your projects? And did you have any expectations? Yes. So I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. So doing a project, doing a internship in my neighborhood where I could participate in and take an active lead in my neighborhood, it really meant a lot to me. So Bailey's Cafe, I've been working with Bailey's ever since I was in high school. So like to do an internship there and to work with the kids, it was just great. So while I was working at Bailey's for the six weeks in this internship, I worked with the dance teacher, Kadeem Alston Roman, as we focused on dance as movement, dance as a means to explore identity, to break down sexism, what does racism mean? How can we like make a change? Even if you're just a kid, how can you do that? And as I was working with Kadeem, I also worked with UBW, Urban Bush Women Summer Leadership Institute, where I sought out to understand through dance, song, story sharing, um, practices of community engagement, workshops with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, um, internalized racial oppression, and the power structure that underlies racism in this country. So the issues that I was exploring in my internships, they were issues that I tried truly feel connected to, especially since I've been living in Brooklyn, so I get to give back to my community. Um, similar to Jamaira, I was drawn to um, my topic because of where I came from. Um, the project started with the India China Institute here at the New School, and well, their prompt was, what is a problem in, in India or China that you would like to investigate right now? And for me, I think as globalization becomes a very, very um, normal thing to us, I was actually interested in um, what are the aspects of culture, whether it's material, whether it's um, the way we connect to a place that, um, that is almost intangible or invisible, but it could just be a habit or the language that we speak um, that made a place a home. 
And so my process of discovery um, was very much about looking at towns, um, villages to cities. Um, so I got to travel t um, between um, different places in China and really looked at, you know, houses that were, um, or buildings that were built from um, 200 years ago to very modern um, cities that have been um, um, sort of transformed into something that a New Yorker would be very familiar with because of the skyscrapers and the steel and glass. So um, that was what sort of drew me to begin my process. And over to you. <laughs> and it's really interesting because even though both of their projects were quite tangible and mine was intangible and being that it was online, I felt very connected because as my heritage is from Kenya, I could see things happening through Instagram and Tumblr and Facebook. And I just knew that there was some like electricity almost, really like connecting a lot of the young people and so many people were so motivated into this. And so when I even started seeing images of just the different lifestyles and just how young people are really expressing themselves, I knew that I wanted to be a part of it as much as I wanted to technically discover it. And so when I was able to travel to Kenya, it completely transformed the way I even thought about how the, the internet is just one aspect of it. Because there are events that are put on from the various images that they put together. And there are people that connect for the first time on Instagram, but then meet up in a really rural spot in Nairobi. So it was just a form of me understanding more about my own culture, which drew me to discover it. And within that experience, I know that my process of discovery changed time and time again, because of just traveling to all the different studios. I mean, I was under the impression that I could visit all of the artists in Kenya and like make a huge, huge project. But of course, we know that it's t definitely not the case. And so I wanted to find out more from my partners. How did your experience within the process of discovery change? And what sort of role did the environment play in that? Yeah, so um, my process of discovery changed depending on what environment I was in. So when I was working at Bailey's, I was working with peop young people from the ages of seven to 19 years old. So I was one of the oldest people in the room, one of the artists, one of the teaching artists, the facilitators. At UBW, however, I was the youngest person in the room. So it was a lot of learning from the, the older women who were there, a lot of me taking what they're telling me back to Bailey's and teaching the younger ones. So at Bailey's, we were exploring like, um, more simple topics, like what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a warrior in your society? Opposed to at UBW, we were exploring, okay, what does racism mean? How can you attack get back at racism through your body, through dance? How can you communicate through movement? So, I mean, I was really challenged over the summer, getting out of my comfort zone, and also I was really comfortable at the same time teaching the little ones. So, I don't know, my process of discovery was always changing constantly. Wow, um, yeah, I think I had something similar too, in a way. Well, I began with, I began with um, discovering a place through, you know, Google Maps first, um, understanding it from this, now that I realize it's a, you know, bird's eye view or God's eye view. And when I was actually there in the street and in person, the scale of things changed. I wasn't looking from top down, I was looking from the street, I was observing people and not roads. Um, and so that sort of changed the perspective of the way I went about studying the sensibilities of place. Um, and yet another thing that changed me, which similar to you, was being informed by someone older. I managed to talk to some of the professors um, who were teaching at um, an architecture school in China, and they shared with us, um, you know, there's always this um, conflict between, say, building new buildings and also preserving old ones. And 
it's something as simple as resources and um, sanitation. He was working on a project in Yunnan, and houses there were much older. Um, they were built of like hair, and they were easily over a century old. But um, preserving that or rebuilding that, maintaining that would um, require resources that you could easily build, say, for public, you know, standard apartment housing that were cleaner and better. So what do we do in those cases? There's that conflict there. And that changed the way I start to ask questions as well. So um, it sparked me off on a different direction. And, and I think it's that different direction that kind of leads you to this new sort of idea of like what your project could even turn out to be. Because as you see, we all had our own expectations of what this might turn into with our various different works. But, and that kind of leads into how the discovery phase actually truly never ends. You're always discovering a new way to kind of find your project, find your identity, find your sort of justice, whether it's through dance, whether it's through architecture, or even something as vague as social media. And so as we continue with discovering, we lead into the create. So simply put, we're in the create section now. Simply put, creative placemaking, it basically means utilizing the power of arts, culture, and creativity to serve a community's interests while also driving a broader agenda for social change. So with that being said, creative placemaking can ultimately make a community better. So I just want to pose the question to you both of where did you find yourself within the creative placemaking practice in your project? So like for me, I worked in bed -Stuy. So like place matters, place definitely matters. And I was working with kids, but like for you, Leigh, I know like that definitely was not the case. So we, you know, we have some differences, you know? yeah. Um, indeed, well for me, placeness does matter in the sense that yes, I did look at um, geographical places, but also I'm um, in training as a design student. Um, that space is a little bit more mental or metaphorical. It was the space between the user and the designer and that relationship of empathy, particularly from the designer's point of view. Because whenever we're designing a place or a product for someone, we are making certain decisions for them. How they're going to sleep, how they're going to, what is their distance from their bedroom to the kitchen, and um, how you know, say a table, whether it's in Chinese, dining tables are often round, whereas in Western cultures, they're um, rectangle. How does that change the dynamics and interaction over dinner? Um, and so that negotiation between designer and user, as well as being able to understand where they're coming from and the kind of life they want to live becomes this space where creativity happens because you're suddenly um, designing or creating um, a new way of interaction or creating um, a product or a space that allows the traditional ways of interaction to be preserved. And I think that's what's something quite um, magical about this relationship. It's really, really funny because when you think of creative placemaking, you do think of something tangible. You know, you think about the roundness of a table versus like the rectangular version. You think about all the different spaces that we engage with as we're with other people. But now I think we're entering into a phase where the internet space is just as malleable. And so that was definitely my sort of take on creative placemaking because, for example, with Nest Collective, yes, they have a physical office, but as I was doing my personal interviews, 80% of the time they were either on Skype or they were looking at Tumblr or they were in talking on the phone with someone else who was of Kenyan background but lived in Amsterdam. So there was all these different engagements through machinery or devices and it's kind of, 
it it's interesting to see how we dictate that now through social media. You know, there's certain aesthetics that now can be seen. There's certain hashtags that you can use where you can plug into this world. And so with creative placemaking, I feel like for the internet, it's not as defined. And I think that's the beauty of it because it allows those who were kind of forgotten within really physical um, voices or physical platforms to now have a really permanent voice on the internet space. Well, <laughs> that, okay, that's a lot to think about. So in the creative play, I feel like I was directly in the middle, like smack in the middle of the creative placemaking practice because I was working at Bailey's and I was also working at UBW and both organizations create and conduct their work through a very, very, very informed sense of social justice issues with whatever community they're working in. So I had to learn that. And like with Bailey's and with UBW, we didn't just come into neighborhoods and we didn't just say, like go to people's houses and just get their kids and create this summer program and just say, okay, we're gonna teach your kids this, this is good, this is how they should grow up to be, this is the type of person they should be in the world, and like, that's that. No, we didn't do that. We actually tried to understand what kids, what, what activities do kids like? What activities do kids wanna do? And how can we teach something positive within these activities that these kids are doing? Not force, but something that the kids will actually enjoy doing so that they wanna become better people, so that they wanna become leaders and artists in their community to teach these things to the younger generation. So as I was learning all of these things over the summer, I feel like I was just gaining a better and better understanding of what creative placemaking means, how can I take a bigger role in my community, and how can I just do good things. Thanks, Mark. Um, can I see this real quick for the next question? <laughs> so, yeah, with that being said, um, I just want to... For the next question, I just want to, I know, okay, so I know over the summer we all have a ton of different experiences. We all learn a ton of different things. So I know this is going to be a hard question. So what is one, what was the most memorable and what was the most creative experience from your internship or from your project that you did over the summer? Just one. You don't have to, just, just one, just one good moment. I guess it's the food. The food I got to eat. I mean, I was exploring different villages and, and towns and cities, so I figured the best way of, you know, having a taste of local culture was to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the events, because, um, you know, because I really assumed that a lot of the things that I was going to be looking at were actually going to be on the computer or on my phone. I think the vibrancy was actually when I got to visit some of the artists and then they would take me on their kind of day and night and going out with some of them were really, really wild. But <laughs> it, I think it would have to be some of the events that I attended. So for me, the best moment over the summer was the final performance. So even though I was working with these kids at Bailey's for six weeks, at the end of the summer program, it was a performance. And this performance, it was a combination of all of the things that the kids did over the summer, all of the things that they wanted to share for their parents and represent. And the final performance, it was beautiful. So if I can just ask the audience to stand. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is like a presentation, and you're probably like, okay, what's going on? All right, so at Bailey's, this is, if everybody could come from their seats and just get in like a circle around, like an oval, because we're gonna do a little bit of movement. If you're able, if you feel good enough to get up and do it, if not, it's fine, you can just watch. So we have to stand in the circle because this is how it's done. This is gonna be the proper way. Everybody should be able to see one another's face. Okay, so good evening everybody, now that we're up. So I'm going, we're gonna do a shakedown. So what is a shakedown? So at Bailey's over the summer, we would do a shakedown before we danced, before we did a presentation. It was just a shakedown and we stand in a circle so that everybody could see each other's face and as you're shaking down, you could just look at one another and just feel that sense of connection. So the shakedown goes like this. You'll raise your arm and you'll start counting from 10. Everybody out loud. So it'll go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, four, three, 
two, one. Your other hand. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Your leg ten, nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Other leg ten, nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now we'll do that until we get to one, and it'll speed up. Just let's do it, okay? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. 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 Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. 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 Two, one, two, one. Two, one, two, one. One, 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 one. Thank you all for participating in that blood rushing. I'm tired. Okay. Now it's okay. So now that we're all rejuvenated, <laughs> um, we would like to get into this question of inherit, um, which can sound very glamorous. Um, so as cultural heirs, do you think we have a responsibility towards the cultural legacies that we inherit? And if so, what kind? <laughs> I definitely do believe that we have a responsibility, but I think that responsibility kind of changes depending on the type of platform that you are discussing. So for example, with in relationship to the internet and through specifically Instagram, if you go on hashtag new, spelled N-U, Nairobi, you'll see all these various images of people and like they're tagged and who they are and what they're exhibiting, but they aren't necessarily responsible for that picture being there, but they know that it is of them and they know that they have this image to upkeep and to maintain. And so with that, all of that, it's something that lasts forever. And so as you know that the you change as a person, your aesthetics change, your ideas sort of change, I think the responsibility then comes into keep that, you know, keep all of your memories and understand as you grow that this was a part of you, but you change. So I, I would assume that, of course, Instagram is something that we view as really, uh, it's not something that's supposed to be taken seriously. It's a little bit lighthearted, but I think as these people grow up, they'll come to understand that this is now their sort of livelihood and they'll take it as such. So I think the responsibility comes from that. Yeah, I kind of agree. Um, over the summer, um, the connection that I feel, okay, so moving back, inherit. Over the summer, the youth in Bailey's Cafe, it was a program called Sankofa. And Sankofa means to go and to give back. So in this workshop, the woman Priscilla, she was teaching the people in the program that, and it was, a, it was like a photo video making program. So she was teaching the youth that you never leave your ancestors and your ancestry and whatever your ancestors have taught you, whatever rituals or cultural things that you come from, you always preserve that, you never leave it behind. And like, and relating this back to create, I feel like whatever you inherit from like your family, whatever you inherit from your ancestors, people that have passed, people that have came before you, you're supposed to preserve that and you're supposed to create something new with that. Instead of just erasing all of the old stuff, you take it and you build on that. That's how I feel. Yeah, um, I actually thought of a very um, interesting um, phrase, like a tree cannot grow without its roots. And I think that um, besides, besides, you know, being responsible for them, we have to recognize that th these legacies or these 
cultural backgrounds that we all have. There are things that nourish us and make up who we are and help us, you know, find ourselves in this very vast world. And so um, there's also this tension that I've realized, um, especially, I guess, in, in architecture is very straightforward. To build a new building, sometimes you have to tear down an old one, and sometimes those are landmarks, but what gets decided whether they're a landmark or not? And also, is there space for these new breakthroughs or a, a movement that defines today's age? And so um, this, I guess, antagonistic tension between create and inherit, how do you think we sort of reconcile that? For you, it's a little different, because you're dealing with this new terrain of social media. But how do you think that actually can you know, contribute to this whole antagonism that's going on? I think it's the same sort of argument that comes in the fact that a lot of the people who use Instagram for their livelihood don't necessarily know that it will last forever. You know, these this data is stored somewhere that will be kept and it will also just be available if you keep scrolling down on someone's Instagram or Tumblr or Facebook even for that matter. So with this sort of tension, what I think is that as these two collectives continue to do their work and as even the environment changes, their work will reflect that. And I think it's, as much as it isn't tangible, it's still something that you can sort of see and remember because within their photos, they're taken in specific landmarks and places. And so maybe as the younger or younger people within Nairobi sort of see those places and see those photos, they'll say like, oh, where was this building? Or where was this party? Or where was that market of places? So I think as the environment changes, it's sort of like these photos and artworks kind of remain as a souvenir of that time. And even though that time is right now, we have to reflect into what that will look like for the future. And so I think that's the, that's the main sort of discourse of the internet and how that, um, between create and inherit, how we can kind of maintain both and have an equilibrium between the both of them. But I do find that if I had to sort of choose between the two, I would always insist on the creating, but rather focus on how we can maintain the thing that we're inheriting through creating something new. So whether it's like a remix of a song see yes yes that <laughs> oh my that just made me think about something so it was a weaving workshop that happened over the summer where we would take the youth seven to 19 we will all take a trip to the senior center and while at the senior center it would be weaving and the elders would teach the youth how to weave and like the traditions that they learn it would be some singing going on and it was just like a tool for community engagement so I think the antagonism lies when you think that you can't create unless, no, 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 no. I think, wait, I just confused myself. I think that the problem, the problem is when people feel like in order to create, they only have to create something new. They can't bring in, they can't inherit. Oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. Okay, <laughs> I just confused myself. Okay, yeah, 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 so I, you can. <laughs> No, I definitely understand. It's like it's applying the principles behind behind the things we inherit, or certain considerations, the sensibilities they have, and then reinterpreting them um, in in contemporary language. And so, yeah, and I mean, we don't forget past art movements just because they were in the past. We still remember them, and we're often inspired by them. And that's why I think there is space for both to coexist. And there's create and inherit. It's not one after another. It's simultaneous. So now that we have the completed stuck. There we go. That looks dangerous. <laughs> um, we have a completed globe, and we see that there are actually multiple places around the world. Yeah, that that is being identified as places 
just people in this room identify with as um, either home or have a common sense of belonging to. And so I think right now to sort of finish up our discussion and open it so we can invite you to join, I think I would just like to ask what is your next question? Especially you, Equa, because you're joining the workforce. So from that position, how are you going to continue this this interrogation? I think definitely by doing the work. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of uncovering a lot of African stories, especially the contemporary stories, and just seeing how we can exemplify them and have give them their own agency and what that would look like in the 21st century because a lot of stories and things have yet to be told so not even to say that they're new they just need to be uncovered mm -hmm. so i think my sort of duty even though this is sort of grandiose but i would love to be a part of that group that is considered uncovering those stories whether they're online or finding a place for them online or in person through things like this and yeah just continuing that conversation because there's room for everyone yeah i think i'm also going to continue my work over this summer i plan on interning with bailey's once again hopefully with ubw also um it's kind of hard to get an internship with them <laughs> But yeah, I think I'll just be continuing my work and continuing to use arts as a way to connect elders and youth and to continue to be intergenerational, intergenerational and just to continue making the world better through arts. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I think I'm interested in say ethical questions. And I think there's a new sort of consideration we have today, sustainability. How do we how do we reconcile that with, say, traditional methods of building where maybe people didn't really think about sustainability as much, but also maybe certain traditional method or materials like bamboo could help inspire us to innovate further and find a different way of solving this problem that we all seem to talk about, but it becomes like a bonus if you have a green building rather than it being the default. So yeah, um, any questions from the ground? And of course, we have postcards for everyone, um, <laughs> few, few, which are going to be distributed. But meanwhile, um, they look like that. <laughs> feel free to mark wherever you feel home to, mail it to yourself, to someone who is in, who is in that other part of the world, who you see as family. and. and Take several, yeah. And questions from the floor, C comments. And make sure to say where you put. All yeah. So Tell us where you're from. <laughs> So I was just curious, um, it's sort of a process question which we asked before too, but all three of you, when, did you know each other before this program? Did you know anything about each other's projects? And, and how did you come to this kind of through line of, of, of your, your three projects? I mean, we didn't know each other at all. I had already left the new school, kind of, so I wasn't even on campus. But um, um, so when we were brought together through the, symposi through the symposium, excuse me, we were able to just see the sort of common threads, and we knew that it want we wanted to discuss culture, and we wanted to discuss like how that legacy plays into it. And then a lot of times we kind of just looked at it as how do we describe home? Because for each of us, this place that we're discussing is home in ways uh, one way. So I think through that we kind of then found this commonality of like we discovered something and then we created something and now you've all inherited something so <laughs> yeah anybody else all right if not hi 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 um, thank where you did you put on the globe oh i put minnesota which awesome. is where, where i'm from and also romania where my uh mother's family was from 
Very cool. Um, I like that. And uh, and I don't know where my father's family was from, actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm I'm curious, Jamira, about the choice you had us you had us engage in an embodied experience, yeah. which which I've seen hap try to. I've seen in panels somebody trying to get that to happen, mm -hmm. and it falls really flat. So I want to <laughs> congratulate you that what you Yay! truly that what you chose did not fall flat at all. But I'm wondering what what your thinking was behind asking us to do that. Yeah. So actually, we've had many rehearsals trying to see where we could place this and how it could fit in seamlessly without any errors or people feeling like too weird and uncomfortable. And like, what would happen if nobody got up? Like, that would be embarrassing. So we really, really worked through this. But at Bailey's, I just knew that the shakedown was the go to thing. Nobody felt uncomfortable doing a shakedown. It's just to get your energy up. So I didn't want to do anything like too off the wall. But the create, the word create that you guys saw on the screen, that was creativity right there. That was a creative, that was, that was create. So that really represented create and it had to be done at that moment. Yes, so that's how we knew. And he knew it was gonna be fun, so. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, we knew it was gonna be fun. Uh, so firstly, I can't believe there's three Australians here. I'm usually the only one. Like, who the hell are the other two? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the only way you can find out. Like, the okay, we could take over now. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask um, everyone about the relationship between sort of doing new things to articulate pasts mm. and the relationship between sort of contemporary kinds of practices and does that sort of change the things you're trying to inherit along the mm. way? And what's the responsibility involved in that? I think, wow. As designers, probably that's that's a question we always want to think about. In the same, because there's a sense of guilt when you say, "I just want to be myself and I want to like reject the old passe things." But at the same time, um, the idea of sort of letting go of your roots feels a little bit like cultural erosion if everybody is doing it, and it's scary. And also the I this notion of progress, right? Um, I guess China has a lot of cities that were examples where, oh, an advanced city is basically the superimposition of Wall Street onto not just one part of the city, but basically all of the city. Um, and that's, that's scary and can be detrimental to the social fabric, to the lives of the people, and environmentally, it's also very detrimental. Um, and so in light of that, I think being aware that you know, industrial, uh, industrialization, now we're paying the price, and that you know, developing countries, whether it's Africa, whether it's China, or even new, new building in, um, developed world, in the developed world, the awareness that sustainability is not just the environment, but also culture and, um, say, family structures, is actually points that can inspire you to design in a way that can accommodate that. And I think that's what, when you know, your limitations and your problems suddenly become opportunities that you can take on, and is one way of sort of negotiating and closing that gap. Thank you. Okay, I think we have to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, and thank you to Mark. He's the best, the best like guidance we have for us professors. Thank you.